business. But the but the but the trick is to get people to give you the money. <laughs> so they have to, they have to believe you do something for them, right? Like produce a portfolio that beats the market, right? Which is what which we did most of the time. I, I, I I'm not claiming we beat it by a huge amount, but most of the time we did. We started mutual funds. We managed one of Vanguard's mutual funds. We managed a mutual fund in Saudi Arabia. I think I mentioned that before. We had a couple of other things. And then we had a whole bunch of institutional clients. We had CalPERS, you know, we had Citibank, we have John Deere and company. We had, you know, a bunch of the Fortune 500 pension funds that we're doing. So the JP Morgan in New York approached us saying they'd like to buy our company. And I said, well, okay, so what do you want to pay for? And they mentioned a price that was beyond my wildest dreams in terms of money that I could ever imagine having in my life. And the only trouble was they wanted Steve and I to work in New York for five years with them. Steve wouldn't do it. He didn't want to have a boss. So that was it. <laughs> so we didn't do it. And a few years later, we sold the, we sold Roland Ross to our junior employees and got out of the, out of the business entirely. We started a couple of other businesses too, but, uh, uh, one business using option prices to value stock option grants for corporations. We had a lot of clients doing that too, you know, but that was more of a consulting firm. It wasn't the, it wasn't the same thing as a money management firm. Dick, going into these ventures, how much of it was an opportunity to be in a laboratory environment as an academic, if you will, and how much of it was just the rush of being in the business world and, and, and operating in it? Well, it was some of both because the, you realize that when when I when we did Roll and Russ Asset Management, we were the first company that actually applied an academic idea, which was the multi-factor asset pricing that Steve, you know, pioneered. We were the first company that ever did that. If you look today at investment management firms, there are thousands of them doing the same thing. And we didn't have the business sense to expand the, you know, the company into what it could have been. You know, we, we never, we weren't really businessmen. We were academics, really. We applied a theory and empirical results that supported that theory that we developed as academics. And we saw an opportunity to at least start a small company, but, but actually we missed an opportunity to make it a gigantic company. There are many, many investment management firms now that do multi-factor asset pricing. And we were the first one. So I think there's a, there's a mixture of both, but, but, you know, I would, I would say at Goldman Sachs and in Roland Ross, which is the two main business ventures I have, partly both of those was the sheer joy of being a, in business and making money is in business and doing things that are that are that are worth doing from a business perspective i mean at goldman sachs um you know we <clears throat> goldman sachs went into the mortgage-backed securities business when i went there they had never done it before and i hired 53 people in the time I was there, half of whom were PhDs in physics and stuff like that, and some of Caltech <laughs> students and, and others, and some. So we started a trading desk. So I so we built the models for the traders on the trading desk. We had an investment banking function, which meant that we did mergers and acquisitions of mortgage-related companies like thrift institutions and savings and loan companies and things like that. We did mergers for those. And we did our own trading for our own proprietorship 
and we built in mortgage backed securities are complicated things and they need an academic, they need academic research to understand them because you, you've got to, you've got to model the prepayment propensity of people, which is psychological partly, right? And there's a lot of different varieties of mortgage backed securities, all, all of which are very different. We, we invented when I was at Goldman Sachs, in fact, my group invented the strip mortgage backed securities where we would take a standard mortgage and, and separate the principal and the interest and sell it as two separate, as two separate uh, securities. And we did that and made, we made a lot of money doing that until other people got wind of, of what, what we're doing and started doing it themselves. We cornered the market on adjustable rate mortgages. Nobody would trade with us because we had the best prepayment law. You know? So I, I would say that in Goldman Sachs, you know, a lot of it was business, um, but there was an underlying academic perspective, underlying research thing, because we needed to do pretty fundamental academic research to understand how to do it. it, it it's, these things are not at all easy to deal with. And today, you know, how many people have lost fortunes in mortgage-backed securities because they do, they've done things that are that are not smart. But you know, we we always made money. But uh, I was always in charge of being the cautious person that said, "Okay, we've got to hedge this position. We, we shouldn't do that trade." You know, blah, blah, blah. so let's. But of course, Goldman Sachs in those days was a pure partnership, so the partners were very very wary of any kind of risk. <laughs> It came out of their own pockets. Dick, did you it always know that you were going to go back to UCLA? Did you ever give serious thought to making this your, your new life? Oh, yeah. As I told you, when they said, would you like to take over Goldman Sachs Asset Management if Steve would come and, and run it with you? I said, I, I expected to to continue doing that and to resign from UCLA. Hmm. Or when J.P. Morgan offered to buy our company, you know, 20 years later. But uh uh, I so I did think I might do that, and you know when I when I was in New York City uh, those years at Goldman Sachs, I you know my wife still stayed in L.A. As I told you, once she got to L.A., she never wanted to leave. Yeah. <laughs> so, I got, so we would commute. You know, every other weekend I would commute. I would. Uh, I mean, I knew the People Express seven forty seven intimately. I go that I I take the red eye back to New York on Sunday night and go straight to Wall Street on Monday morning. And, and uh, she would come up. And so some of the partners, you know, when, when they were offering us these jobs, they invited us to their homes and things like that and would try to persuade her to that she needed to be, have an apartment like this apartment on the Upper East Side of New York, you know, with a painting by William de Koenig in the foyer and stuff like that. You know? <laughs> That's what you could have if you... Yeah, she spurned all that. But she had her own ideas about a career. My wife uh, started a restaurant in is twenty seven years ago in Ojai. She started Suzanne's Cuisine, and it she ran it for twenty five years. It was the in the Zagat Guide, at one point, it was the second, it was rated the second best French restaurant in Southern California. Wow. It was very, it was a very successful restaurant. Is this where the vineyard started? Well, we had the, we had the, the ranch and the property before she started the restaurant, a couple of years before that. I actually bought that with money I made at Goldman Sachs. So when I came back from Goldman Sachs, I bought this ranch in Ojai. Uh, which I say it's a ranch. It's 360 acres, so it's pretty big. But and I put in a vineyard with help from uh, some professors at UC Davis in the in the wine department and, and and stuff like that. But but she in this in a little town of Ojai, she bought a house on the main street, remodeled it, turned it into a restaurant, and opened. Uh, 
a restaurant, a very, very good restaurant, actually. Became the most popular restaurant by far in that whole area. And it was popular. She didn't close it after 25 years because they had no business. She made money in the restaurant. But her daughter, the one that I told you went to Chicago and got her MBA at Chicago, she left her job on, on Wall Street to come and help her mother run the restaurant, hmm. which annoyed me to no end since I paid all her tuition. She <laughs> <laughs> and she was making a lot more money on Wall Street than she was making with her mother. But she did the business side of it and, and managed the, the wait staff and stuff for 25 years with her mother. My wife, Suzanne, was the kitchen. She's the chef. Of course, she had seven other people in the kitchen, you know, but she did all the, she did the, it, at the beginning, she did a lot of the cooking and she concocted all the recipes and this and that and the other thing. Uh, it was a very good place. But what happened after 25 years is that Sandra, our daughter, said, you know, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. I'm 50 years old. I've been doing this for 25 years. I'm going to do something else, you know? So I, I want to close the restaurant. Besides, you're almost 80 years old now. You're too old to be a line chef anymore. And she had not been working that much in the kitchen in the last few years anyway, right? She's, she'd be in the dining room greeting the guests and that sort of stuff. But, the, uh, but anyway, so they decided to close it. And my wife was very, very unhappy for at least a couple of years. She missed it so much, but she finally got over it. And, uh, and Sandra, the, my daughter, went into a different business. She owns trailer parks now. <laughs> I keep telling her, I said, you know, owning a restaurant and owning a trailer park? Yeah, which is been, I mean, the trailer parks are a lot more profitable. Than that. <laughs> Dick, coming back from Goldman, how did that experience affect your research, the kinds of questions you were interested in pursuing? Well, I, I did get a lot of ideas to do uh, serious scientific papers from my experience at Goldman. I published maybe seven papers on mortgage-backed securities, on prepayment modeling, and how to do the things that we were doing in practice at Goldman. So after our competitors have caught on to what we did, because we kept it secret initially, I'd write a paper on, for example, the prepayment modeling that we use at Goldman Sachs for adjustable rate mortgages. Let's say, you know, adjustable rate mortgages are different than fixed rate mortgages because they their interest rate fluctuates with some index, such as a treasury bill rate or something like that. So the prepayment, the prepayment behavior is different for those. So I, w I wrote a bunch of papers uh, on mortgage-backed securities and valuing them and modeling them and stuff like that. And then I also started writing papers on options because we did a lot of option pricing at Goldman Sachs, and, and in fact, the the essence of, of a prepayment model is an option because the, the borrower has the right to decide to prepay the mortgage whenever they feel like it, and that's an option pricing model. It's a long-term and difficult option pricing model because if you have a 30-year mortgage, the borrower can decide to prepay that any time in those 30 years. Well, when will they prepay it? exactly when you don't want them to do it because they want to re they can refinance at a lower rate which means you get the money prepaid and then you have to reinvest at a lower rate so you know there's a there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of reasons why the options on mortgage backed securities are extremely valuable to the to the to the borrower and a big decrement in the value of a mortgage to the lender so we we would model that in and since they're long-term options, they don't, they can't be used in the typical, the typical option pricing that we have like in Black Shoals is for short-term options, like a month, three months to maturity and stuff. So, 
I think it's going to be 30 years. Right. And not only that, there's a, there's a psychology here because it's, it, when you look at the prepayment behavior of average homeowners in the economy, they don't do the optimal thing. You know, they do psychologically, psycho, psychological things, which they make the decision to prepay. And it's not always the best decision. But in order to model that, you have to model the psychology of why they do it. So for, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's there's one big factor that, that makes a, a, a prepayment option worth less. It's called burnout. And what it what it says is that if you've got a bunch of mortgages in a pool, there's some people in the pool that will refinance right away when interest rates go down. But not everybody. Some people will keep paying those high interest rates, maybe for 30 years. So you've got to figure out who are these idiots that are keep prepaying at seven percent interest when they can refinance at three percent. Right? But there are people that do that, and and one of the big one of the big ways one of the big valuation questions in the prepayment model is how much burnout is there in that in that pool of mortgages that you're valuing there? Is is everybody going to do it right away, or is there going to be a big people and bunch of people in North Dakota that are just stuck in their dairy farms and never think think about it? <laughs> So that leads you to exactly that kind of thing is that you have mortgage backed securities that are originated in all kinds of different areas, different cities, states, and so on, right? Even different countries in some cases. And each one of those has a different behavioral way of behave, a different thing, way they behave, right? So the people in Alabama don't, don't behave the same as the people in, you know, Washington, DC or, California. Uh, I had an interesting story about that. We, we I, I mentioned a few minutes ago, a thing called a stripped mortgage backed securities, where you, you take the principal payments and the interest payments and you separate them out and you sell those as two separate securities. Right? So when the investment bank does this, let's say we Goldman Sachs do this, we buy a mortgage, we strip it into these two pieces and we sell the two pieces. Right? If we can sell the two pieces for more than what we pay for the mortgage, immediate profit, right? And we generally could do that for the first year and a half or so we were doing it. And then one of the salesmen from Goldman Sachs, who covers the Southeast, called me up and he says, you know, <clears throat> I always thought that some people, some financial institutions would buy the principal piece and some financial institution would buy the interest piece, but neither one would buy both pieces because they would buy, they could buy the original mortgage, which is the same thing as both pieces put back together. Right? He said, but Alabama federal down here has been buying both pieces. Would you call them up and tell them to stop that? That's not in there. This is Goldman Sachs trying to, trying to help the client, you know, so I called the guy, I called the, the CEO, uh, the uh, treasurer at Alabama Federal in Montgomery. I said, you know, how come you're buying both pieces of these strip mortgage bank securities? You could buy the, the whole mortgage cheaper. Yeah. He says, oh, no, you don't understand. He says, there's a tax option in this. He says, look, what we do is that in January, we buy both pieces. And then at the end of the year, one of them will go up and one goes down. I said, yeah, that's right. So what we do is we hang on to the one that goes up. It's a capital gain. And we sell the one that goes down. That's a tax loss. And we end up with more money than if we buy the original one. Because we don't know whether that was going to go up or down. But what we know about the IO and PO is that they're always going to go in opposite directions. We don't know which one's going to go down and which one's up, but by the end of the year, it's almost sure that one will do one way and one the other. And I thought, you know, I really thought this guy was dumb. 
he turns out to be smarter than any of <laughs> Dick, tell me about your your tenure when you were at the at president of, of the American uh, Financial Association. Well, that's an honorary thing. You know, you get elected because mainly because of your publications. You know, people know who you are from from your your publications, and and so they there's an it's a one year term. Uh, you know, there's an election every year, uh, and there's you know there there are two candidates usually. In uh, they. they the, the the election really happens in the in the previous year between two people who are then will take over in the subsequent year as president of the association. The president of the association really doesn't have much to do except two things. One is he's in charge of organizing the annual convention, which in the case of ec- economics and in the case of financial finance occurs in January, the first week of January every year, which which is also the job market for new PhDs. They, they go to the, that convention and interview various universities that are hiring new PhDs. That's the, the so-called new hire job market every year in economics and finance. That happens in the first week of January. But as president, you basically have to decide on the papers that are going to be presented at the convention, but you have a committee. You know, you appoint friends to and, and colleagues to different places to to read the papers and decide which ones will be accepted for the program for the convention. So you form the program. The second thing you have to do, in, in the more time-consuming thing, is that you you're supposed to write a paper that will be published in the Journal of Finance in the middle of the following year. So I wrote a paper. Uh, th- I was still at Goldman Sachs when I was elected. And I wrote a paper called that has the, the following distinguishing characteristic. It's got the shortest title of any paper ever published in finance. What was the it? Title of paper, <laughs> the title of the paper is R squared, R to the exponent two. That's it. That's it. <laughs> 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 and, and actually, to my surprise, it turned out to be a pretty well-cited paper, not because of the title, but because the the subject of the paper was to look at news articles about companies and to see whether you could explain a large part of the returns of companies by news that came out about the companies. So we know that that new information is what causes stock prices to move. So my idea was that the the R square, the explanatory power of this new information should be high. That is, if you if you could tabulate every new item that came out about a company, you should be able to explain most of the volatility of the stock price. Now, not in advance. This is X after the fact, right? So you look at you look at the stock today and some news story comes out about the stock, then the price will move today or maybe tomorrow and so on. So I built models that that looked at all the stories and I collected all the data about this. And to my incredible surprise, the R squares are not that impressive. In other words, there's a lot of volatility in returns that are not even related to news stories. That's why the title R square, because the essence is the R square, which is the explanatory power in a regression, is way too low compared to what you might think you get from trying to tabulate all the news items that come out about a stock. And so I I did a big empirical study of this and tried every different way I could think of to increase the R square. And the most I could ever get was, was about 30% for a big public companies, which means that 70% of the day-to-day variation in returns cannot be explained by publicly available news. So what can it be? Well, private people that collect private information, it's not public information, 
in acting on that public information? It has to be something like that. Or maybe just pure irrationality, like the psychologists say, that people get a bug in their bonnet, they're going to buy, you know, AT&T today, and they go buy zillions of shares, right? That drives the price up. There's no public or private news associated with that. And even today, you know, that paper still gets lots of citations and people trying still today to add to the explanatory power, thinking there must be some way <laughs> to explain this variation in, uh, in returns. So there was a, a fellow at Yale named Robert Schiller. You know the name, Robert Schiller? Sure, yeah. And he won Nobel Prize a mm -hmm. few years ago. His main contribution to finance was to show that there's too much volatility in returns relative to what there should be given the changes in the dividends that companies have. This was done before my paper, but it was, it's, it's a similar idea and a similar empirical result in the sense that the returns fluctuate too much to be rational. That's what he says. Now, I don't know whether it's rational or not, because I don't know how you figure out who's doing irrational trading, but, but you know, the, he, he's saying that these fluctuations have nothing to do with, with fundamentals. They're just irrational people going in and buying and selling stocks when they shouldn't be. Yeah. Uh, Dick, what opportunities did you have to interact with undergraduates at UCLA? None unless they took a course in the, in the business school. UCLA does not have an undergraduate business school. Mm -hmm. There's only MBA and PhD. Okay. So there are no undergraduates. Uh, there's a small program that teaches undergraduate accounting, but I didn't, I didn't teach accounting. So I didn't, I didn't get involved in that. Uh, so the entire time, the 38 years I was in UCLA, I didn't teach anybody except MBAs and PhDs. That was it. I usually taught a PhD course every year, one quarter, and then an, an MBA course. And I taught a lot of different MBA courses. I taught international finance. I taught fixed income securities. I taught security analysis. I taught you know mergers and acquisitions. I taught a lot of different things just because I didn't want to repeat myself over and over again. Every, every <laughs> and I've done that at Caltech too. I taught, I taught the first course in finance a couple of times in, in the last two years. I've taught a, a course on investments, uh, but I'm getting a little tired of that one too. So I'm going to see if I can do something different. Uh, Dick, what was your reaction to the dot-com boom and bubble burst? In what ways was this predictable based on the way the market operated previously? And in what ways did you see this as, as, as new events? Well, it was new events, right? There were new inventions coming out. There were, you know, cell phones. There was, it, it wasn't just uh, electronics though. It was biotech companies were part of this. You know, there was a, a huge boom in, in, uh, in biotech in, in the early um, I guess the late eighties, I guess this was right in the early nineties, something like that. I, I forget the dates, but so biotech companies, I think there were something like IPOs, initial public offerings that as a new company goes to market, it's formed and go and it's traded on the New York stock exchange or, or the NASDAQ. I think there were 850 biotech companies that did IPOs in the late 1980s. So there was a huge inflow of brand new companies. Well, here's the thing about a brand new company. Who knows what they're worth? Most of them had no, zero profit, right? And you were lucky if they, if they even had any revenue and they didn't have any. So when people were looking at a biotech company and the investment bankers who, you see, when a company goes on an IPO, they have to hire, they, Generally, they hire an investment banker, a Goldman Sachs, for instance, that takes the takes the the stock to the to the public, you know, goes through all the registration, you know, the regulatory 
paperwork and things like that, and then distributes the stock in a syndicate to investors, their own investors, or usually they form a, a, a syndicate of several investment banks that sell these, these initial public offerings to new companies. So they did that for the dot-com and the biotech, you know, all those companies, brand new companies, nobody has a clue, including the investment bankers about what they're worth. So I know, for example, because studies have been done about biotech, I'm not so familiar with the telephone, you know, dot com, that the main thing that caused the value of a biotech company to be high when it, when it did an initial public offering was the credentials of the chief scientists on the staff of the biotech company. So often these are little companies formed by, let's say, a professor at Caltech in the chemical engineering department, you know, form, goes to a, you know, goes to some friend and puts some angel investing in this and then eventually goes to a, gets a couple of people and starts working on a product and then gets an investment banker to sell the stock, you know, in an IPO. But the main thing that causes that stock to be high in price are the, the people on the staff, the senior staff of the company. So when you look at the biotech prices, you can see they're very highly related to the quality of the PhDs that you have working on the biotech products that the company is, is bringing to market. Uh, and I, I think the same thing is true of .com as well, although I, it's not so clear in .com because in, in the case of biotech, you know, most of these people are chemical engineers or biologists or something like that, that you can, you can look at their credentials and see, okay, this guy is a, is a biotech scientist from, you know, Harvard and his senior partner is one from Berkeley and the, the junior guy on their staff is a Caltech PhD, right? That company is worth a lot of money because they're likely to invest, invent something good. And so the price that the investment bankers set on the initial public offering is just all over the place, depending on that more than anything else. Initially, when they did these, let's say the first 50 or so biotech they did, the investment bankers had no idea that this was true. They learned that as they, as they took more companies to market and they noticed that the ones that had better qualified staffs in the aftermarket went up much more than the ones that didn't have such well qualified staff. So the investment bankers learn from the first few biotechs that they did that the way to price these properly is to charge high prices for companies that had, that had really well qualified staffs. Now, after the fact, sometimes these companies fail. In fact, most of them fail, I think. You know, of 850 biotech companies that were started up in the late 80s and early 90s, how many are still here? Very few, right? You know, Genentech and, I don't know, what's that company in Westlake, uh, Amgen, you know, there, there's some, but some of them came became really hugely successful, but most of them didn't. So the biotech com, the dot com crash, was you take a when you buy one of these, and a lot of investment managers bought every single one that came out, with the idea that five percent of them will really be successful, but that'll be enough to make enough money to pay for the losses in the other 95%. So when you look at the, the, the dot-com crash, you know, I, I don't know if you look at the number of stocks that are traded on the New York Stock Exchange, there was a peak in the early 90s of something like, let's say 5,000 companies. It's 3,000 now because 2,000 of these companies no longer exist. Now that's been a long time, you know, so there's been other failures since then, but 
But you know, when you think about it, if you don't have any idea which company is which, which you think biotech is going to make a lot of money, why not just buy a small fraction of every single one that comes out? You know, it's like it's like insurance. Right? Your house is probably not going to burn down, but if it does, you know, <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna eat it, right? It's the same thing in reverse. Right? Dick, I'm particularly I, I interested in your consulting work for law firms. What were some of the things that law firms wanted to retain your services for? Valuation mainly. So um, <clears throat> when there's a lawsuit, um, a fed, let's say federal court, which is where I had most of the most of these uh, cases, there's a let's say a company issues a fraudulent financial statement and gets caught. And when they, when this is disclosed to the market, the market price falls dramatically because people thought the earnings had been, let's say $10 a share, and it turns out they're only $5 a share. So there's a big price drop. There's a lawsuit because the people that bought the stock, believing that the, that the earnings were $10 a share, sue the company for not having disclosed the truth. Okay, that's called a 10B5 case under federal law. So there's a, so the reason they hire an expert like me is to try to figure out what would, what is the correct price that they should have paid prior to the disclosure of the fraudulent information. So for the people that bought the stock prior to that. So there's a, it's, it's complicated in the sense that there are many other things that might have happened before that aren't related to the fraud. So you got you got to try to figure out uh, and testify that you know Mr. X paid nine dollars a share for this, and really he should have only paid seven dollars a share. Stuff like that. So it's, it's a valuation uh, problem. So most of the things. Uh, our valuation. I, I, just, I have some really funny stories about this. There was the there was a case in L.A. <clears throat> actually, that one of the first cases I had was a case of the defendant was Budget Rent a Car, and Budget Rent a Car, <clears throat> the car rental company, issued a statement that they had they had purchased from an inventor a engine that turned water into gasoline and they were going to install it in all their rental cars and lower the price of their rental car. <laughs> and there was a on channel five in la that this is really funny because channel five had the inventor on and he hooked up a garden hose to one end of this paraphernalia in a stream of fire came out the other end. <laughs> <laughs> so he was on one night and the price of budget went a car went from I forgot the numbers let's say it's three dollars a share to twenty dollars a share you know just overnight right then so they had all these professors on channel five testifying that this violated the second law of thermodynamics and all this stuff. And I, I, re I remember there were even some Caltech professors on there who said that this is impossible. This, you can never have this happen. <laughs> and, and sure enough, it was. So what happened was that the guy, the, the channel five news anchor invited this inventor back, let's say a month later, he brought his machine in, hooked it all up. And then somebody noticed that there was an electric cable that was plugged into the wall. And when they unplugged the cable, no fire came out of this. <laughs> so then the, the price fell from $20 a share to $3 a share. <laughs> so that was a very clear cut case. All the people that bought. So so I was I, I remember talking to somebody in the physics department at, at, at UCLA about this. And I said, you know, 
everybody believes the second law of thermodynamics, except the people who pay twenty dollars a share for budget rent a car. <laughs> but I said, what is the probability that the second law of thermodynamics is wrong? And he says, well, practically impossible. I said, well, is it one percent? Is it wrong? Well, yeah, maybe it's a half a percent. I say, well, you know, if it's half a percent that the second law of thermodynamics is wrong, budget rent a car should have sold for two thousand dollars a share, not twenty. Because you see, a half a percent that this thing really works means that that machine is worth an incredible fortune, right? Of course, most physics professors thought that the problem was zero, not a half a percent. <laughs> <laughs> Dick, was there anything of concern to you in the run-up to 2008? Did anything seem off that that uh, you were focused on in 2006, 2007? Yeah, I think uh, I wasn't the only one that thought that... Uh, I would say this, that I don't think there was anything wrong with the financial markets. I think the problem was within the housing sector. I think the housing market was um, was overheated. And the, the reason for that is that the growth rate in real wages for the average person in the economy was doing very, very well in the early 80s. In other words, the, the unemployment was low and the real wage rate was going up. And when you think about housing, the main thing that determines the value of a house is the lifetime earnings of people that buy housing. Right? So if 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 you think your if you think your earnings are going to grow over your lifetime, let's say three percent, and you can afford to to pay much more for a house today than if you think your earnings are going to grow at two percent, because your you know three percent versus two percent doesn't sound like much, but over a lifetime, that's enough to make a house go up by about about a third in value. If everybody believed that, right? So if a house is selling for a hundred dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, or for example, and people revise their growth rate from 2% to 3%. I misspoke. It could go up, but the house could go up 50% if everybody believed that. If they suddenly said, you know, my earnings are not going to grow at 2%, they're going to grow at 3%. And what happened in the early 80s, I think, is that a lot of people started thinking, hey, you know what? The growth rate is really good for real wages. I think I can afford a big growth. I, I can't hear you again. The microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. People people were saying I can't. I I can afford to pay more for uh, this house. And the lenders who were issuing mortgages also believed it. They so they issued mortgages to people whose incomes currently at the current time would not have qualified them for such a large mortgage. But it did qualify them based on the presumption that that those people would have growing incomes over time and would be able to pay off these mortgages over time. I remember very well at UCLA when a guy from Freddie Mac came out and gave a talk and a guy from a local savings and loan institution came out and gave a talk and he was saying, you know, we're issuing alt a mortgages which are basically mortgages that basically depend only on what people say their income is going to be over the next 10 or 20 years right? so there people were lending money to to those individuals when they probably shouldn't have been doing so but you know it it was understandable that they would do it because I mean, their business was to lend mortgages, right? They, so they were, they were issuing mortgages to these unqual really people that were unqualified based on current 
levels of income, but would be qualified if you look at their lifetime income. So what happened at the end of, toward the end of 2007, was that there was a big revision in people's expected lifetime income. That's what I think happened. I think those people decided, hey, you know what? My income is not going to grow at 3%. It's only going to grow at 2%. And guess what? I can't afford this house that I just, that I just bought, that I just bought for $150,000 with a mortgage. It's a $145,000. So I'm not going to pay the, I'm not going to pay the mortgage interest. <laughs> the mortgage, the mortgage lender says, Hey, wait a minute. How come you have to pay the interest? I'm not going to do it. You know, here's the house. And a lot of people did that. And it's not just me saying this, but it's obvious from the ev clear cut evidence, prices of houses fell. Mm -hmm. They fell dramatically. Mm -hmm. They went down 25 or 30% in some, in some areas. I mean, you know that, right? Remember that? I mean, yeah. house prices just, so, you know, people, people had believed that houses just keep going up in value. That's not true. There's a lot of volatility in house prices. In 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 2007, you know, they it really showed up. The prices fell. They fell below the values of the more the, the amount of the loans that were outstanding on the mortgages in many cases, and people just walked away. So the borrowers, um, the lenders, then a lot of these lenders borrowed money to finance the, the loans to the homeowners, they couldn't repay the the loans they borrowed either. So you had a big debacle in the financial sector, but I think the whole thing was caused by the housing market initially. Well, by the housing market indirectly, but the real fault was in people's expectation about what their lifetime income was going to be, what the growth rate or real wages were going to be. And they, one reason they, they revised that downward was because of the election that year when they elected the Democrat, uh, which is who's not good for real wages, you know, that caused revisions in, in people's expectations. Um, I think, I think that's what happened. I wrote a paper on that mm -hmm. uh, called the misdiagnosis of a crisis that won the award in the, in the in the financial analyst journal which i tried to i tried to show that uh, that you can't you can't have a crisis because a lender and borrower default because for every borrower there's a lender so basically if a if a borrower defaults it just takes money away from the lender so there's no real loss in real in aggregate there's no loss when there's a default in a a fixed income security like a bond there's a loss if the house price goes down because that's a real asset okay? but not just between let's say a borrower and a mortgage and a lender and a mortgage because that's just a transfer between one party and another there's no there's no increase or decrease in real assets when that happens so i tried to argue in that paper that uh unlike a lot of other people that blamed it on uh you know, financial institutions just uh, lending improperly and taking the year. I, I was saying that they did that. That's true, but that couldn't have caused the crash. What was your reaction to the government response, the bailout? Well, as a Chicago school person. I don't like it because they're taking money from the taxpayers and giving it out to people. And that's bad from a Chicago school perspective. I think that the, that the Fed, at least in the short term, you know, does need to intervene from time to time in markets when they're melting down. They did that with Lehman. They didn't do that with Lehman Brothers, but they did that with, with AIG, remember? Mm -hmm. They helped AIG weather the storm. 
So, I mean, there's something to be said for, for the Fed or the Treasury on a short-term basis doing this, but I don't think, I don't think the either one should be buying up zillions of dollars worth of mortgages and holding them for long time periods. Now they're having to sell them off, right? I mean, they've held. Look, look at this. They've 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 held onto these mortgages now for what is this? Thirteen years, something like that. Uh, it shouldn't be the gut. It shouldn't be the role of government to do that. This inevitably gets us into issues of morality about who helps people in distress. Yeah, yeah. But you help some people and you hurt others. Somebody's going to have to pay the bill for this, you know. I mean, look at the current the, the current budget uh, in the in the new administration. You know, it's a four trillion dollar budget. The government doesn't have its own money. It doesn't have any money. It's got to get the money from somewhere. And where does it get it? There are only two places that it can get it. Three places, really. It can borrow it, but that doesn't really get it any money. It's going to have to pay that back. It can raise taxes. Okay. Tax rates are already, you know, way too high. It, or it can print money. But that's just an inflation on the price level. That'll, you know, if it prints money, inflation will go up, and that's it's another form of a tax. It's a tax on people holding cash balances. So, so basically, there are only two ways that the government can finance this. One is by raising taxes, and the other is by raising taxes by printing money. So, it's helping some people. But what about those taxpayers in the next generation? <laughs> what about my grandchildren? <laughs> I don't I don't think that they should have to pay for this. Dick, the year after in 2009, you were named financial engineer of the year. And I'm curious that the, the term financial engineer, how much of that is this is real engineering and how much of it is a term of art? Well, it applies. There's a there's an international association of financial engineers, who and it's made up of people who do quantitative uh, modeling for all kinds of financial institutions and also some academics who do quantitative modeling. So, in a way, it is really engineering because when you do something like develop a trading model for, let's say, adjustable rate mortgages, that's really not much difference than, than building an airplane. You know, it's it's engineering. You've got to get, you know, the bells and whistles right and do it just and think of all the different contingencies and test it just like you would in a, in a wind tunnel. I don't really see us that different. And, and secondly, the math involved is is almost the same. I mean, you're using the same mathematical techniques. I mean, we use, you know, calculus, differential equations. I mean, that's what they do in chemical engineering. Use differential equations. That's what we do in, in finance when we're studying financial markets. We use we use that. I mean, they I'll give you an example: the Black Scholes model, the famous Black Scholes option pricing model. That's a model that that show that Black and Scholes derived from a differential equation. It turns out that their equation is the same thing as the heat transfer equation in physics. It's the exact same form. Wow. <laughs> you know, they didn't know that until they were all done, you know. But honestly, it, it really is engineering. So, it, so I don't think people need to be sheepish about calling themselves financial engineers because they're they're basically doing the same sorts of things that 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 other engineers are doing, mm -hmm. you know, um, of course, other engineers are, are dealing with completely different problems, but, but the techniques and the, and the approaches are, are, are pretty much similar. Um, and, uh, but you know, it, there, this association, this international association of financial engineers, which is a pretty big association, they, they do give a, an award every year to the person who 
called it, which they call the financial engineer of the year. Well, they gave it to me, but they've given it to a lot of academics. I mean, I'm far from the first one. There, there are many other people. Steve was one, Steve Ross, and, you know, a lot of other academics have, before me have, have done it. Even some that shouldn't have gotten it. <laughs> uh, and I was totally shocked myself because I don't really think of myself as a financial engineer. Although I guess I am, but uh, in, in a sense, but uh, I was really surprised. Dick, as we mentioned right at the beginning of our talk, obviously it was not a surprise to you, UCLA's retirement policy. When you were thinking about what you might do afterwards, were you considering non-academic opportunities as well, given your deep contacts and experience in the business world? Yeah, I thought that, except that I didn't really have any, you know, I didn't have any obvious places that I could go for work. I, I know a bunch of people in L.A. I wanted to stay in Los Angeles. That's number one, right? You know, we our children and grandchildren, everybody are here. So I'm not, I don't want to move back to New York or any, any Texas or any place else. So that was the first consideration. And secondly, I could have I could have looked for a job at a at an investment management firm that's a local firm. For example, Dimensional Fund Advisors. I know David Booth very very well. Gene Fama is on their board of directors. You know, I could have gotten a job there without any problem at all. They pulled up and went to Texas before I knew what happened, right? <laughs> they moved around. Right <laughs> so then I, you know, there are other there are other firms too, but I I didn't really want to go to work for a, another investment management firm. I, I'd rather just have a, be an academic, write my papers, you know, lead a tranquil life. <laughs> and just one year into your tenure at Caltech, you won the Anassis Prize. Tell me about that. Well, that's another award that, you know, that's an international award that's given every two years. Um, there are several of these. There's the Deutsche Bank Prize. Steve won that, I think, the same year, the year before I won the Onassis Prize. The Onassis Prize was set up by Aristotle Onassis, as you probably know, mm -hmm. the the uh, Greek shipping guy. It was part of his um part of his uh, legacy, when he died, he set up a foundation whose board gives that prize every year to two people. I won it jointly with Stuart Myers, who's a professor at MIT and a specialist in corporate finance. Uh, so we both were awarded that. I must say that the English really know how to do ceremonies. It's incredible. So I went to the, I went to London they invited my whole family, paid our airfare and everything, and they, they have a big ceremony in the Guild Hall in the London, in the city of London, with the guys playing the trumpets and, you know, you know, and there there probably were 500 people in the audience, you know, uh, so it's it's a very impressive thing, you know. I got up and. I didn't know what to say, so I said, this is, for a, a country boy from Arkansas, this is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but my grandson went uh, with me, and several of my family, he, they, you have to wear a tuxedo. And he was about nine at the time. He got his tuxedo fitted in London. He was a everything. So you'll never forget that. Have you had a chance to collaborate with Michael Ewan since you've been at Caltech? Who? Michael Ewan's? Oh, Evans. You mean Michael Evans? Oh, is it uh, the, 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 the he, W he, is pronounced with a V? Right? Uh, yeah. That's, that's a Welsh name. Ah. And, According to him, it's pronounced Evans. Okay, got it's it. Pro it's pronounced you. It sounds like you E W E N S, right? Okay, so I didn't know who you were talking about. I've collaborated with him. I haven't written a paper with him, but I've uh, you know I've done other things with him. I collaborate with him on on the finance workshop, which he's in charge of now. And I, you know, and we we work together on special events. Like we we had an event 
a few years ago where we invited Steve Ross and Bob Merton, uh, a Nobel laureate and, and, and several people to campus and had a day long uh, you know, finance thing for alumni where we invited local alums. Michael and I worked on organizing that. So we've done several things together. I've not written a paper with him yet though. He's a specialist in venture capital, which you know, I don't really know anything about. So I haven't uh, seen the opportunity to do anything with him yet. I have I have written a paper with Charles Plot that but he's a a different person. And he's he's mainly interested in doing artificial markets where he gets people in on computers and they trade with each other. And we did a study where we looked at the at the spreads in bid ask prices and looked to see what caused those things to change. We published that paper. Uh, so I would I would think I'd probably more likely work with him. He's an economist, but you know he's interested in financial markets and, and doing experimental markets in his lab where he has all these students on computers that are trading with each other. He's done other things before he did it with me. I mean, he's done other financial markets, uh, for example. Have you enjoyed the opportunity to interact with, with, with undergraduates since you've been at Caltech? Yeah, they, I taught, I, I taught first, the first, uh, three, first three courses I taught were this beginning course. Uh, and the enrollment was incredible. I had 75 people in each one of those classes, which for Caltech is unheard of, you know, that many people. Uh, I think the average class size at Caltech is seven, something like that. But there are so many people in other divisions that are interested in finding out something about finance because they think they might have to get a job there someday. You know, that's my guess that um, they flocked to that course. So I had, I had a lot of undergraduate students in that course. And there are they, they are very, very talented. Some of them are, you know, much better than me at math, things like that. I also had the, the basketball team in my class the second year. The famous Caltech basketball team that lost 300 games in a row and finally won one when I was teaching them. <laughs> and, their, and their picture was in Sports Illustrated. Did you see that? I did not. Uh, I'll have to look. Yeah, it was about about let's see, it's about four years ago now, three or four years ago. Their record was something like I mean, it's not the same guys, obviously, but they, their record was something like zero and two hundred and fifty, and they won a game when I was teaching them. So they were elated. Yeah, and they and they the Sports Illustrated had their, had their picture in it. The longest, the longest losing streak is is now broken. <laughs> well, Dick, we talked about your your current work right at the beginning of our talk. So, for the last part of our conversation, I'd like to ask a few broadly retrospective questions about your career, and then we'll end looking to the future. So, the okay. first is, I'm curious, what kinds of stock answers you've developed over the years to people who want to know things that are not necessarily in your research agenda, but fall generally in the topic of, you know, personal finance wisdom. What are some of the things that you like to tell people when they inevitably ask you questions about how do I retire securely? What's a good investment strategy? What are some of the things that, that, that you, you find yourself saying over and over? Well, it depends on how good a friend they are. <laughs> <laughs> well put. <laughs> if they're a really good friend, I say I have the faintest idea. <laughs> right. <laughs> like and the physicist and the dark good, matter, right? <laughs> if, if they're not such a good friend, I say bye. Yeah, yeah. Which is not a bad idea because generally the stock market does do pretty well on average. So if you buy and hold on, you know, you're going to do pretty well over 20 years probably. So. If somebody's asking me when they're when they're fairly young, you know, I say, yeah, just put your money in Vanguard. It's got very low fees. That's another thing. Say, 
don't pay any fees to anybody. Put your money in a place that has very low fees, which Vanguard is the obvious choice because they probably have the lowest fees in the industry. And buy a big diversified investment in, in one of Vanguard's portfolios. So diversification always pays. That's clear, right? You don't ever want to be in a position where you have all your eggs in one basket. That's an easy prescription. And it, it is absolutely true as well. Second thing is, I haven't the faintest idea which way the market's going to go tomorrow, next week, or next year. So don't ask me. But the larger story is you don't know, but nobody knows. I don't know. And, and, and if anybody says they know, don't listen to them. <laughs> But in the long run, you know, if you buy a diversified portfolio of common stocks and you don't go crazy trading them, just hang on, you know, you probably do pretty well. The historical experience has shown that you earn, you know, six or 7% per year on average, not every year, of course, some they're down years as well as up years as you well know, but you know, that's a pretty good idea. Some people I tell, depending on the age, something slightly different. And I do this for myself. When you're a certain age and you build up a certain nest egg, the best thing for you to do is to not risk it, not risk losing money because you're going to use it for your retirement. So I'm 82 years old now. I've got eight more years, maybe. And I've got, you know, I've got, a, I've got a good nest egg. I don't want to pull it up, put it all in a, in, in the stock market and see half of it evaporate. And then only half, half as much when I'm, you know, 84, right? So what do you do in that case? Particularly when inflation is a problem, okay? Because inflation is a serious problem for retirees because if you're, pension is in fixed nominal terms, you're going to end up losing in real terms. Your purchasing power parity is not going to keep up with inflation. So what do you do? Well, there is a security, which is Dick, which is designed for this situation. It's this, it's the U S treasury inflation index bond. You know about these bonds? Sure. Okay. So if you go to Vanguard, they have a mutual fund that's entirely invested in inflation protected bond. So last month when the inflation rate was four and a half percent, that portfolio went up four and a half percent on an annual adjusted basis. It was, last month it was inflation was the CPI went up four and a half percent on an annual basis. That portfolio went up the same amount. It's indexed to the CPI. Now, the only risk there is that the government will renege on its obligations to pay it, <laughs> which I don't think they're going to do anytime in our lifetime. You know, I, I can't imagine that the U.S. government would not pay its, you know, its promise payments on all of its bonds on, on nominal bonds. They don't have a problem because they just have to print the money to pay those. Right. But on inflation index bonds, they have to get real money to pay that because, because they, they go up every month by, by the inflation rate as defined by the consumer price index, which, I mean, that's not perfect, but it's better than anything else that you, that you can come up with. So, you know, if you're 80 years old and you want to say, I've got $5 million, that's plenty of money for me the rest of my life, as long as I don't lose anything. There you go. Right? Dick, our discussion has been largely devoid of overly political uh, issues. And perhaps that has something to do with the fact that you come from the Chicago school and it's libertarian tradition. But I wonder in all of your decades in the field, if you have any overall ideas about whether the Democrats or the Republicans are overall better for the economy. Well, I, I don't know, to tell you the truth. I like the Republicans 
attitudes about other things like freedom of expression, liberty, and things like that. I like their I like it better than the Democrats because I think the Democrats are 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 more prone, well not not everyone, more prone to interfere with people's lives, which I don't like being a you know basically a libertarian. But in terms of which one's better for the economy, I mean it's really hard to know because when you look back at history in you know data or I'm a, I'm a data guy. I like to look at the, at the empirical evidence. There's not much evidence in favor of one versus the other. There have been very good empirical conditions under Republicans, and there have also been good ones under Democrats. I mean, Bill Clinton had a boom. I didn't happen to like his personal life. <laughs> But, uh, but and I don't really think he had anything to do with it, except he didn't bother anybody, <laughs> you know. On the other hand, you know, you have people like, uh, you know, Reagan, I think during Reagan's administration, there was a boom. His, the previous one, Jimmy Carter, was pretty disastrous, but that was just one term. But there have been Republicans. How about Herbert Hoover back in the 30s? He was horrible, right? You know, the economy went to hell under Herbert Hoover. So I don't really know who's um, when you when you try to do an empirical study of this, and some of my colleagues in HNSS who are political scientists do this stuff. You know, they look they look at the Republicans and Democrats and the, try to figure out you know which one's going to be better for the economy. I don't think you can point to any hard empirical evidence that proves it one way or the other. You know, it's pretty ambiguous. But, you know, maybe one reason for that is that there's really not that much difference, you know, in terms of economic policy. I, I guess there's some difference in, you know, military and things like that, maybe. But in economic policy, you know, I mean, there's, okay, when, when Trump was president, he cut the tax rate, the federal tax rate, from 39% to 36%. Big deal. I like to see it cut to five percent. You know, I mean, thirty-nine percent, and then you know, and then of course Biden is going to raise it back to thirty percent. But it, you know, I don't think that's going to make. It's not going to make enough difference that you can empirically say, okay, that ruined everything or that helped everything. It's not going. It's not going to do it, right? It's just not enough. And, 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 and typically that's the difference between Republicans. And then you look at spending, you know, you look at Democrats are supposed to be the big spenders, but Republicans are too. They may not spend it on the same things, but you know, we had huge deficits under, under Trump, under Bush, you know, we had huge deficits under everybody. Obama, I mean, he's practically broke the bank he had a big debt. And of course, Biden is going to do even more, it looks like, although I'm not sure that's whether that's going to happen or not. It's not done yet. And so, you know, tax rates and spending, is there really much difference? I don't know. Dick, an overall question about your research as it relates to computers. Over the course of your career, computers went from essentially non-existent to really enormous capacity today. How has that changed the field, both academically and in the financial markets? It's everything. I would think that the entire field has been pretty much dictated by what's happening to computer power. When I was at Chicago as a graduate student, we had an IBM 650. You don't know what that is. It's a machine that you have to put a tray in and you program it by by taking a, a, a pin and wiring it to another slot in the in the thing. So it takes you hours to do the simplest thing. So that was the first machine that I ever saw. And I thought I had gone to heaven because we got another machine that red punched cards paper punch cards. 
and I could punch cards a lot quicker than I could wire trays in the machine, you know? And pretty soon after that, we got a magnetic tape where we had reels of tape. I'm not kidding. You see how big this is? I'd say 14 inches in diameter, something like that, right? And on each one of those reels, there was maybe 400 kilobytes of information. So when we got the stock market data from when we first started doing the stock market uh, studies at CRISP and at the University of Chicago, I worked for a guy named Larry Fisher, another professor who was in charge of that. And we would go to the computer center in the middle of the night and take off one reel of tape after another. We had to mount 26 tapes to read through one stock market day's quotation. Now, can you imagine, you know, the, the, I think, you know, as, as computers have gotten much smaller and much more powerful, and more efficient, I, we can do things that I could never have imagined. I, I've done papers now that involve data from every single transaction from every single stock exchange around the world for 20 years, billions of pieces of information, really multi-billions of pieces, right? I'm talking about every trade that's done on every single market from Rio de Janeiro to Sydney. You know, I have the data for that on a, on a computer for a long time period. So I can look minute, second by second, at the connection between every single stock market around the world. Every second and every day, you can look to see if something happens in New York at 12, 10 p.m. on Monday, does it happen in Sydney at 12, 11 p.m.? That's the kind of thing you can do today with the, with these databases and computers. You know, it's just, it's just incredible what you, so, so the, the truth is, is that every paper I have written over my entire career has had an improvement in every single case in the ability to do data analysis, every empirical paper. I've written some theory paper but there. It doesn't matter, but every empirical paper I started doing, you know, annual observations because that's all that would fit on the computer. Then we did monthly observations and then we, and let's say that took 10 years. Then we did weekly observation. That's another thing. Then we had daily and, and now we do trade to trade. And not only do we have every single transaction, but we have prior to every trade, the bid ask spread that's offered on the stock exchange prior to the trade. So we can see whether or not the person that made the trade did it at the bid price of the ask price, which tells you whether or not they were buying or selling. And, you know, it's, it's really phenomenal what you can do today. Well, Dick, for my last question, let's look to the future. For however long you want to remain active, what do you want to accomplish? What are the issues that in the next year, three years, five years, however long you define your research agenda, what do you want to do? What's most compelling to you? Well, you know, you asked me a few minutes ago about what I tell people when they ask me questions like this. Yeah. So I'm a believer in efficient markets. And what that means is that if I knew what I was going to do in the next five years, I would have already done it. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> it probably helps to keep, th keep things interesting also. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I would like to be able, I hope I'm healthy enough to still contribute to things. You know, I'm, I, let's face it. I'm an unusual person in this regard. Gene Fama is another one. There are very, very few people in their eighties still doing impure, doing research. Hardly anyone, you know, he and I talk about it sometimes like, you know, the, the, the typical person today is in their thirties, right? 
I just hope I'm still healthy enough to keep doing something worthwhile. Well, one know? thing it suggests is that you love doing it. Yeah, I do. Well, Dick, it's been a great pleasure spending this time with you. I'm so glad we were able to do this. I'd like to thank you so much. My, my pleasure.